telling us about his life through his paintings and be telling us about other well-known uh, painters on the island and in Naples. So we look forward to Dave Fuller. Dave? Hello, Dave. <laughs> Oh, here he comes, okay. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Do y'all have a full tummy? Yes. Ready to go? Yes. There you go. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about art this afternoon. There are going to be several aspects of this. One is the fact that I'm going to go through sort of how I got started, which might be of interest to you. Then we'll move on to some other art that I've done recently, and I even brought a copy of what I just finished last week, because somebody was always going to ask, what are you working on? <laughs> okay, and I have it. So, uh, to begin with, we need to cycle back to 1950. It's a long time ago, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 1950. Garden City, Long Island, New York. Right? Stewart Elementary School. And I'm in Mrs. Sims' fifth grade class. And she sends me out the door at 2 o'clock one afternoon, down the hall. <laughs> Where are you going, Dave? I'm going to the art room. Oh, the art room. Yeah. Back then, uh, we had kind of the, uh, the teachers were really into what you were up to and what you were doing. They could figure out at a tender age where your where your you know where your interesting parts were, and Mrs. Sims got in touch, I think, with the art teacher, and she said, "I think David needs some help with art." So they sent me down to the art teacher. I did that every Tuesday and Thursday through the fifth grade. And I learned a lot about that. I graduated from doing stick men, you know, one of these things, to real people with arms and legs. I learned a lot about art. I learned about how things are proportioned. I learned about color, how to make that work in art. There were other people in the class with me. I was not the only one. It continued on through the sixth grade because I still had Mrs. Sims, and she knew exactly who I was at that point. And on to the sixth grade, the same thing. I gained more and more confidence in myself, and I felt like I knew how to draw things. And at that point, I went to the seventh grade. New school, Garden City Junior High School. Okay, 7th, 8th, and ninth, junior high. The kids were much bigger than me. I mean, I, I was a little guy then, and they were just huge. And I went back to the same uh, kind of routine, but in a more intense way. Because what I wanted to do was obviously learn more. And so the, 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 the teaching was, 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 was far more in depth, and we got into a lot of different subjects. In the process of doing that particular run, the teacher came up with an assignment for us, and it was to develop a safety uh, picture, I guess you'd say. Um, and, and the idea was that she laid out several possible themes for this safety picture. And one was, uh, look both ways before crossing the street. Well. That seemed pretty easy, didn't it? Another was, turn around, don't drown if you see water. Okay, well, all right. The one I picked was, be extra alert on rainy days. 
Oh boy, that's a good one. Anyway, we set to work and she gave us a week to get this assignment done. And then we were to bring our assignment forward and explain it to the rest of the class. And after that, we were to take it home to our parents. Easy enough. And that's what I did. That particular painting is right over here. Nineteen fifty two for this guy. I was twelve years old at the time. Uh, yeah. See I put a cute little seal there. You know, seals used to balance the ball. So I had him balance an umbrella. I thought I thought that was kinda cool. You know. And here's some raindrops coming down. And none of them are hitting a seal, of course, because that's the purpose of the over there, yeah, okay. And so here's the, uh, uh, the wording on that. And my mom, bless her heart, saved this. This is the original. So, and, well, thank you. <laughs> Be extra alert on rainy days, okay. And now we move on to the eighth grade, oh boy. The eighth grade changed everything for me because I had a general science teacher, his name was John Orban Jr. And John Orban got me fired up about science. I mean, this guy was one heck of a teacher. I couldn't believe it. I really loved it. I also loved math, unlike Mark. You know, he doesn't like math. I'm on the other side, he was over here. Okay, so anyway, that got me started. And through high school, I concentrated on science and on math. Um, when I got to be a senior, I applied to college locally at Georgia Tech. I was accepted. And in May of 1957, I graduated from high school. la dee da really good. I had a ticket to college, and I had four months before I had to start school. So I decided I would get a job, and I got a job at Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. You know, I got paid about 75 cents an hour. And so during the day, I would go work for them, and at the, uh, on the weekends, I had the weekends open. So I decided to go ahead and take another shot at art. So I went down to the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, which is a very highly respected place, still is, and I signed up for their summer, summer art program. And I took three courses. The first course was with a gal named Maxine Yalovitz. Maxine was crazy. <laughs> Maxine, uh, it came from a different planet. Uh, she was a, a, a combination of all kinds of things. And she was always going in different directions. She, she was into abstract art. And my art course with her was predicated on doing charcoal renderings on the want ad sections from the Atlanta newspaper because that particular page had a lot of even texture to it. And you could do a, 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 a you know, drawing on top of it and it really looked pretty good. So uh, we did that and I, I was just mesmerized by her. She, she was so enthusiastic. She was about 30 years old. And I found out the last time I checked, she is still living. She's in her late 90s right now. And uh, we've had a conversation uh, or so a while back about things. Uh, the second course I took was in watercolor. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Please. Watercolor, it is a, a difficult sport when it comes to art because in watercolor, First of all, you can't make a mistake. 
Number two, you have to move fast. And you have all these dishes full of all these washes that you make by pouring different colors in the dishes in the water, and you've got these big brushes. And the idea is to move fast and not make a mistake. That does not fit with the way that I operate at all. And that fellow's name was John, and I cannot remember his last name. Uh, he was good, but I was stressed out, and I was really ready to, uh, to, to move on from him. So the third gir girl was Carly Craig. Carly Craig was the quintessential real-type artist. She was conservative. She did regular kind of art. She did still, still life. She did all kinds of outside stuff, landscaping and things like that. And I, I guess I learned a lot from Carly. I got to know her granddaughter, who was an exhibition, in an exhibition here in Miami, in, not Miami, in, uh, in Naples. Uh, and she's also an artist within her own. So that was kind of interesting. But out of those three, and that lasted all summer, the painting that I have to show you comes from the watercolor guy. And that's this one right here. Okay? This is a, and I don't know, I'm going to pick, this is very heavy, so. Ugh. This is a street scene from 15th Avenue in Atlanta, Atlanta, that I did. And uh, this is the. Uh, I was 17, <laughs> going on 21. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm bid what? Uh, 65 what, thousand? Okay. <laughs> Keep your hands in your pockets. Anyway, my mom, she collected, bless her heart, I just absolutely grew up with my mom and dad. But she was just so good at, at taking things like this, and she'd put them away, and I, I would never know she was collecting them. And then she would come back later, and she got this thing framed. I didn't frame that. She framed it. It's heavy because that's real glass on the front. We don't glaze with glass anymore. We use plastic. But uh, anyway, that survived that summer. Uh, and at that point, I started back into college. It, but this whole thing about the art at that point solidified my thoughts that art wasn't a way to make a living or make money. It just didn't seem like it was going to work. Uh, they emphasized, well, you might get a job doing fashion layouts for the department stores in the paper. You know, that's line drawings. I guess I could do that, but ladies' clothes? <laughs> I ain't gonna do that. That's not helpful. Uh, another possible choice was go to work for Coca-Cola and work in their uh, graphic design department and advertising department. They had two departments. If you worked in graphic design, you could design Coke cans. <laughs> Big one, right? Or you could do... Uh, advertising for them and get stuff that goes in the media and that kind of thing. It just doesn't seem like it was going to work out. And so I headed off and started work. Uh, my career after I graduated from college. In college, I decided to do a work-study program. So it took me five years to get through engineering school. So I was a little bit behind some of the guys. I then started working in a way that was kind of haphazard. I was more entrepreneurial than I was anything else. I could not, I'm the kind of person that cannot work for a big company. I'm sorry. I know you guys, there are guys and gals out there that do that. I can appreciate it, but I just was always looking out the window and thinking about something else. Uh, so my career kind of went like this. Okay. One interesting thing happened during that period, just before I started college. I was 
kind of looking around, and I, I, I went to a public swimming pool that we had in Atlanta at Chastain Park. And a lot of guys and young people would, would gather there. And I saw a young lady, and uh, I was real nervous, and I said, oh, no, I can't do anything. <laughs> so I finally got up my nerve, and I asked this young lady to go out with me. She's right here. <laughs> kind of interesting because uh, we went downtown to the Lowe's Theater. That's a big, nice deal, yeah, Lowe's Theater. I had a 55 Chevrolet that was yellow and white with an emerald green interior. <laughs> and the front end bench seat was so slippery that when I turn right, bodies tend to move right over to the left. Yes. So, so we get to the, uh, the theater, and the movie is The Pride and the Passion. Frank Sinatra and Sophie Lauren. Yeah. Anyway, uh, about two thirds, three quarters of the way of the movie, they were pushing this cannon up a hill in the rain. Oh, it was getting really tough. And our hands casually met. Oh, boy. <laughs> Been that way ever since. 66 years. <laughs> anyway, as I started my business career, it, it, it takes two, two people to tango, especially if you've got a couple and, and one person doesn't like a certain way or not. But my, I was so erratic in what I was doing that uh, Joni had a, 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 one of those unique capabilities of sticking with me and moving up and down. Uh, there were periods when we were really down flat, other periods when we weren't. Uh, uh, Ten years after I graduated, which was 1962, uh, we finally got, well, sorry, we finally got married in 1964. It took a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then forward to, uh, to 1972, I was uh, out of a job. Uh-oh, no income. And at that point, I decided kind of that I would go back and, uh, I would go back and see what I could do with art. So believe it or not, I bought some oil paint, which I had never really used before. I bought a couple of canvases, and I decided I would paint in oil paint, okay? And, and it actually worked out fairly well. Uh, I made, I think, four paintings, and I brought one of them to show you here. Uh, this painting is, is kind of interesting because it highlights an event in history. This is also the beginning of my Salvador Dali career. <laughs> Every once in a while you have to change gears. You know, there's a little Kandinsky in there. Okay, I got that. Well, what this is, if you'll remember in 1972, we had a big chess match going on between Russia and the U.S. Bobby Fischer versus Boris Spassky. Boris was the undefeated champion around the world. They met for the final matches in Reykjavik, Iceland. Ever been there? I would say don't bother. <laughs> if you got the money, go to Alaska. It's a whole lot better. Anyway, uh, I did this painting, and it shows Bobby Fischer in kind of a ghostly format here, okay, as he's looking down on his, uh, his quarry, okay? We have the rising sun, which indicates that things are going in his direction. We have a chessboard that spreads out, and in the bottom, over here is poor Boris. <laughs> Boris is dead. The red is dead. 
mean, there he is hanging off the, hanging off the chest match. Anyway, I did that uh, back in 1972. But it is really an oil painting on canvas, which I never did before or after. <laughs> so things went on, and my life continued to go up and down. I got into the uh, area of the 80s, and things started to pick up. I started a business with two guys in Atlanta, and it took off big time. Uh, so much so that in 19... 94, we decided to sell the business. Uh, it was right at the peak of what we thought we could do. When you start a business like this, uh, and you work on it for years, you put so much effort, it's 24-7, you work all the time. I would even work on Sunday, Sunday afternoons, every Sunday. You have to do that to stay up with the competition and to beat them, okay? We were making a medical product and it became the product of choice for, for, for physicians. And all of a sudden, you go from a standpoint of, can we make enough to stay alive as a business to, oh my God, I have so many orders, how can we possibly build all this stuff? So we went through that build-out stage and did, I think, pretty well with it. Anyway, uh, we were acquired in 1994 by a, a, an investment group. And, uh, at that point, I walked out the door and I didn't have a job. Well, there was more than one, and that, that's more than two. It was actually three or four in there, but I, I'm not going to bore you with those. Anyway, so, anyway, we, we, the, I have no job, and Joni and I are looking at one another. We've been in Atlanta our entire lifetime, uh, all through school and all this kind of She went to Emory University, and we used to go back and forth and that kind of thing. Uh, anyway, so we decided that it was time to make a lifestyle change, and we decided to move to Florida. Yeah, Florida. No more gray limbs in the wintertime. No, no more snow, no more ice storms, no more 35 in rain. Oh, yeah. Let's go to find paradise. So we found paradise in Naples, Florida, because Joni had a friend in college that had uh, moved back to his home, which was Naples, and he was an attorney. And he invited us down. We ended up buying a piece of property and then building a house on a canal with the boat out back, and that was the target. Um, it took us two years to do that. We didn't actually move from Atlanta to Naples to 1996, okay? At this point, there's still no art. I haven't done a thing since 1972, so I've strung over a lot of years. And the interesting thing is that fate seems to enter into a lot of different things. After 10 years in Naples, we decided to move again. And in that case, we decided to downsize downsize. We were getting a little bit, you know, <laughs> um, we decided to downsize and we picked uh, Goodland, Florida as the place we wanted to retire to. It, it was sort of picked for us in a way because the guy that bought my house in Naples was part of the company that built the condos that we finally bought into in uh, in, uh, in Goodland, and he had the condo as a showpiece, model home. And we decided that he wanted to get rid of it, so we, we decided we would take it. So we went from this, this kind of a house down to this kind of a house. I mean, it was <laughs> So at that point, here comes Naples, I mean, uh, Goodland, Florida. Naples, uh, Goodland is, uh, it, it is, is a kind of an odd, thing, because in Goodland, we don't have postal delivery. You may not know that, or you may not know that. We have a central post office, and that's how we get our mail. Uh, Judy, who ran the post office, knows everything. She stuffs the boxes. Hmm. Oh. 
No secrets with Judy. <clears throat> and one day I was in there with Judy, and she said, David, I tell you what, I just, I just made an application to my boss to paint the post office, and uh, he agreed to paint the post office. Uh, but I didn't tell him that we weren't going to just paint the walls with paint. We were going to paint the walls with pictures because we were going to get people that lived in Goodland to come in and paint on the walls. And he said, she said, now, David, if you know of anybody that could do that, uh, please let me know because we want to get started. So I went home and I decided that, well, hmm, I could probably do something with that. So I decided to paint the wall, paint the wall. She gave me a space to work with and I put a painting up there. She then sent me a, a very nice message saying, wow, I really like your painting. And I thought, well, wow, that's kind of interesting. So I went home and thought about that. About that time, I get a flyer from the Naples Art Association, which I had joined many years ago, for a CTA for their founders exhibit. Now, CTA is a call for artists, call to artists. And these go out, and then you respond to that and, and bring your work in. So I went home, and I decided that I would I'd try. I, I've never done a, 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 never been anywhere near an art contest in my life. And so I went home and I thought about what to do. And I came up with the idea of using a thought that came in my mind at a dance hall, or the dance recital that my granddaughter went to in Charlotte. There were two girls that came out on stage, I remember them, almost the same height, and they were trying to tap dance, but they never, they never got it together. <laughs> and they started looking at one another and started talking. And I, I couldn't tell if they were cussing each other out because, I, you're on the wrong foot, get over there and you're right there. Or whether they were saying, can you see mom and dad out there? Huh? I don't see them, I don't know. So <laughs> anyway, using that as a background, I painted these two girls on a stage and this is it. Wow. So they're talking to one another. Oh, what are they doing? Yeah, and they're, they're just slightly out of step. You know, the whole thing is crazy. But anyway, uh, so I did this painting, and then we went up. I had to go for intake. Now, intake for an art thing is where you go up, and on a special day at a certain time, like between 10 and, and 4, they, they receive art, and uh, you pay them 20 bucks or whatever it is to put the thing in. And, uh, and, they, uh, you, and you walk away, and, and, and then things go on. So I go up, I was kind of, I kind of embarrassed, so I, went, I, went, I took my painting up to the place, and I'm going like this, I didn't want anybody to see it. You know, I didn't want to embarrass myself. So I get up there, and I walked into the front door of the Von Liebig uh, building, and I said, uh, I need to put my painting in this, in this uh, painting, in, in, in this show. And the girl says, well, you're in the wrong place. You need to go to the intake door. Oh. Okay, so I turn around, I go out, and I come back around the building, and I come in, and oh, look at all those people. Oh, oh there's 25 people, what, what are they doing? So I got, excited, got in line, you know, and I'm looking around like, I don't know what's next. I get up to the desk, and the lady says, well, you gotta fill out this form. So I fill out the form, I put it on the back, and she said, that'll be 20 bucks. and. Uh, We'll call you if you win. And I'm thinking, yeah, sure. Okay. So I leave my little girls at the museum. At the gallery, right? It's not a museum, it's a gallery. Um, so I go home, and nothing 
Nothing happened. I didn't get a call. I didn't expect to get a call, right? Nobody's going to call me and win, get a win on this thing. So time went on, and the gallery lasted about five weeks. Okay, that's kind of an ordinary thing for, for a big gallery. And it was the Founders Gallery, which is the biggest event of the year for the Naples Art Association. So I just feel like I'm learning, you know. So we go to the, uh, we go to the reception. That's uh, about a week from when you put the painting in. And at that point, everybody's going and oohing and on and, and, and that kind of thing. You walk around and look, and you find out where your painting is. That's the first thing you do. You try to think, what do they do with my painting? You know, these are big rooms, and I've got to walk around and find out. So I walked around, I find it, and at that time, Teresa Benjamin comes up to me, and her eyes are wide open. And Teresa says, David, how did you do it? Well, Teresa was my next door neighbor back in Naples. And I said, Teresa, do what? He said, well, your, your picture is in the newspaper over the article about this show. And I said, it can't be. You know, I didn't win anything. Nobody ever called. And sure enough, it was. And I was just stunned. I didn't know what to think about that. So the next day, I went back to the Von Levy Gallery, and I asked to speak to Jack O'Brien, who was the curator, because I need to figure out what, what, you know, what's happening. And he came out, it was very nice, and he said, well, it works like this. When you brought your painting in, we put the paintings all around the gallery on the floor with them leaned up against the wall, and they come all the way around, okay? And then we invite the judge in. The judge comes in with her paper and pencil and maybe with a camera, and she goes around and takes her time and picks out the winners. She hands the winners list to me, and we call the winners, okay? Then I hang the exhibit. That's what the, the curator does, get them off the floor and make it into a nice collegial combination. That's what curators, one of them, what curators do. And then after that, the day after that, I call in the press. And the press comes in, and I don't talk to the press. We show them where the, the exhibit is, and they get to walk around and do whatever they want to do as far as pictures, and then they write the story. And he said, I have no input into that. And what happened to you was, when they went and did their go around the press, they picked your picture as the one they wanted to show the highlight to show, you know? So I said, wow, I didn't know that's the way it worked. So time went on. The show continued for about five weeks. And on the very last day, right, it was, five, it was on a Friday afternoon, about 4.30, I get a call from Naples Art Association. Mr. Fuller, your painting sold. My painting sold? You gotta be kidding. No, it sold. And we actually let the, the buyer take the painting. Uh, we normally don't do that until the, the exhibit is closed, but since it's gonna close in two hours, we gave the, the buyer the, uh, the option to take it, and she did. And, and she paid for it. And uh, therefore, uh, I want to tell you that she wants, the buyer wants you to call her, if you can, and, uh, and she has something she wants to talk to you about. So I said, who is the buyer? And she says, well, it's Betty V, okay? I'm gonna leave her last name off because it's not really the thing you do in order to give people's last names out for buyers and things like that, it's kind of a, a tradition. And so Betty V called me up and said, uh, I really liked your painting, David, and I was wondering if I could get you to come over and hang it for me. I said, well, okay. Give me your address and whatever, and she did. The next day, I'm going down Gordon Drive. I'm not believing this. The houses are getting bigger 
and bigger and bigger. Then I got my little two-door car and a little smoke coming out the back. It's got a lot of miles on it. So I, I go up the driveway, and it's one of these things where that's halfway to town is go up the driveway and you go. So I stopped under, the, under, under this beautiful pork share kind of thing. It, it was a Key West style house that had really been done beautifully. White picket fence, gorgeous landscaping. Ah, me, to die for. I get out and I had a hammer and I had a little hook so I could put in a wall. I don't know if she needed a hook. And, and I'm going in and I knock on the door and this lady comes up to, to, the, to the door dressed in a uniform. And I'm thinking, okay. Uh, and I gave her my name, and she said, well, Mrs. V is ready to receive you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going up the hall behind this lady. She says, okay, we're going to go to the right. Okay, so I go in there and stop, and I'm in this gorgeous living room. Down at the end of the living room is a big fireplace. Do we need a fireplace? In the, in the, I don't know, but they, this is a beautiful fireplace. And above the fireplace is a, is, a, is a beautiful painting, you know? I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Anyway, Betty V says, now, David, if you can, Matilda, whoever that was, has a ladder, and she wants you to get up and take that painting down over the fireplace. And I said, okay. So I go out there and climb up the ladder, and I'm, I pick the painting off, and I'm trying to get out, you know? And I look down in the right-hand corner, and it was a Paul Arsenault painting. Okay, Paul Arsenault is probably the number one painter in Naples. And what am I doing taking his stuff off anybody's wall, right? <laughs> My goodness. So uh, I got the painting down and I put my painting up and she said, oh, that is just beautiful. This lady was, was, was really something special. She was in a wheelchair and she was very immobile, but her emotions and the way she treated things, I found out that she was a collector, basically. Uh, so, in the end, she said, you know, David, maybe you should, maybe you wanna know why I bought your painting. I said, well, that, I, yeah, that would help. And she said, that painting is exactly what happened to me and my, my sister when we were seven years old. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> you know, and I just had to have it, so. There you go. How did you get it back? How did I get it back? That's a great question. There are two of these. Okay. This is, 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 is what I call a sketch painting. This is the one I did originally to get the idea together. And painters do this quite often. I, I do it a lot. In fact, I did it on this, this picture I'll show you today that I just finished. Uh, it gives you an idea of, of, of what's going on, the coloration, whether or not you've got the right balance, that type of thing. And, uh, uh, did you take a picture of those girls? Uh, no. It, it, it's, it's just in your head. Most of it is in my head. I do use photography. It's called reference photography. Every single painter uses reference photography in their paintings if you see something that looks realistic. They have to. Uh, in this case, they probably came from two pictures I took of different people at different times. I changed the costume, I changed their height, that type of thing, to make the, the picture work itself. You see? Did you enlarge the painting, or was that the, the actual The actual one is bigger than this. Uh, I think it is probably about 30 by 30. Well, to put on a fireplace. Yeah, that was amazing. I was absolutely, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a novice at this. I've never done a, a, a show in my life, and here I am <laughs> in, this, in this lady's house, you know, and, and it's just the stuff everywhere. And uh, it was just a, a special time. <clears throat> a sketch. Pardon? This one, you said this one was a sketch, and then you made the original. So the question is, There are two of these, right? Two. She has one. And, and it's bigger. It's bigger. And what, is there anything else on the bigger picture, like any kind of background? Or no. It's just exactly. It's essentially the same thing. Uh -huh. There may be a, 
I put the stage here at a little angle. I don't know if I carried that through on the, uh, on the other one or not. But, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You put a price on it? Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not an artist. Right. <laughs> right. She paid $900 for it. Mm -hmm. Pardon? She said if you know you would have made it 9000 Yeah. <laughs> she wouldn't have. Just another zero to her. <laughs> anyway. Okay, we're now at the point where in uh, this painting was done in uh, about 2008. We had moved to Goodland. We, uh, at that point, I had converted the top part of our condo into, into a studio. And uh, at that point, we also decided we would take another splurge, <laughs> and we bought a condo in Alaska. Okay, the reason for that was we wanted to do something really different in the summertime, and that is a place to do it, believe me. Um, that, that, that particular thing was also resulted in, in a condo in the top part was my studio. In Alaska, I was tied into a gallery in Homer that took my pictures, and uh, that's how we distributed them into, uh, into Alaska. So in Alaska, I did a lot of polar bears, mooses, you know, eagles, one thing or another. For Florida, I do more conventional stuff in the, the Somebody's entering my, my, my show here. Uh, yeah. So anyway, my career kind of started off. Now I'm back into art 100%. I'm all enthused. And it, it's kind of a, kind of a thing where I, the, the, the ideas came fast and furious. Uh, and I did a fair amount of painting, especially in Florida and a, a lot in, in Alaska. And I went back and forth, shipping stuff back and forth. Uh, over the years. Uh, uh, I had a one-man show in, uh, in Alaska, which was very nice, and, uh, and therefore, that's what we had. Now, this next easel is empty, and I've got a, I've got a, a little problem with that, folks, because the, uh, the painting did not get here that's supposed to be there. And here's what happened. <clears throat> the painting was at my daughter's house up in Charlotte, North Carolina. And a week ago, she mailed it to me on UPS. <laughs> yeah, UPS, and it is not here. This morning I checked. I checked the routing, and I checked the number. And it was supposed to be here by 9 o'clock this morning. Is not here. I'm sorry. So I guess at this point, uh, we'll just continue on. I don't know what else to do. Excuse me, hey, excuse me. Right. Whoa. I'm hey. from UPS and I've got, I, I hate to interrupt, but. Whoa, are, hold are you, on. Are you Mr. Fuller? Are you Mr. Fuller? Hold on. Hey. What I've do you got? got? For you here, sir. What do you got, pal? Oh my God. What? I knew you wanted this. Oh. I knew you wanted this. Just a second. You want to hold up there? Yeah. I'm going to take schedule, sir. Okay. Stand there. Got it. Got it. Oh, my God. What's going on here? You know, the least I can do, since, it's, since, I got, since we got it here late, I'm going to, is it okay if I unpackage it for you, yeah, sir? Yeah, just don't get your fingerprints on it, you know? Oh, my gosh. I know that guy. Who is he? Well, that's Albert Einstein. No, it's not. Well, sure looks like him. He doesn't play the piano. Well, he's oh, music. Are crazy? Well, I've read about well, him. I don't know. He's, yeah. He plays lots of music. <laughs> well, yeah. No, no, that, that's not Al, Al E. No, that's not him. No, that's not him. Sorry. But, uh, you know, maybe somebody in the audience knows who that is. 
Well, I don't know. Do these people know? Do you know? Yeah, you know who that is? No? No. Not Thomas Addison. No. No? By the way, what's your name? Darb. Zarb? Darb. Darb? Darb Noslerak. Did you just get off the boat or something? As a matter of fact, the reason this was delayed yeah, was tell because us we, we shipped it, unfortunately, yeah, sure. by boat to your place in Goodland. Boat? I, I went over and I specifically retrieved it and brought it back over here so that we'd have it today. But then, of course, I was going over the Jolly Bridge in my car, and there was an accident. Oh, my goodness. So that's what caused this delay today. And I really apologize. UPS loves your business. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can hardly tell. <laughs> yeah, okay, Zarb, Darb, whatever your name is. Yeah, that's a nice-looking uniform you got there, too. Did you make that yourself, or did they give it to you? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Uh, Should I did? put this over here? For no, don't, 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 oh, yeah, okay. There you go, sir. All right, all right. That's not Thomas Edison, that's not him. By gosh, that sure looks like no. the guy I thought it was. No, it's not. <laughs> it can't possibly be. Well, then who the heck is it? Well, these people, uh, no. Take your hat off and your sunglasses off a second. <laughs> <laughs> That's Zarb. Yeah, it's Darb Noswarak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <an Oscar>. <laughs> Whatever. In this school. All right. All right. Uh, where are you going? I got to make another delivery, another emergency. Another emergency? Another, you know, the, the work is never done. Never done. <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you. Oh, let's hear it for UPS. Aren't they great? Well, we got our painting. But uh, I think what we don't have is an answer to who this is. Do we have anybody that wants to take a guess? It's a very famous. No. No, it's a composer. Pardon? No. Who? No. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to play you a little piece here, is what I'm doing. Row six gets it. So it is Edvard Grieg, uh, but there's some interesting things about this picture. And one is the fact that it is basically a copy of a photograph, okay? Uh, Grieg lived between about 1845 and a little after 1900. Uh, when he died, his estate gave a couple of pictures to the public, put a couple of pictures in the public domain. Okay, that means that you can do anything you want to do with them. There is no copyright associated with that. Um, and this picture is made from one of those photographs that's in the public domain. All right? Um, one of the interesting things though is to figure out the color of his eyes because that's not very evident in any of the uh, uh, photography that they tried. That was the time when photography was really just starting up, okay, the middle 1800s. Um, he went to conservatory 
at a young age and contracted TB. And he lost the use of one lung for the rest of his life. So he was without proper breathing for a long time. Uh, when Joni and I visited Norway in uh, a visit about five years ago, I think, uh, we were treated to a recital at his home. And uh, the home itself is part of an estate that's on the side of a hill that ends in a big lake, beautiful place. At the top of the hill, they've constructed a modern theater with a, a, a setting where you can sit and watch a guy play the piano on a stage. Beyond him is a glass wall, and you look down the hill to, this, to his main house. And then beyond that, you look down and you see the cabin. And the cabin is where he did most of his, uh, most of his work. Uh, and so we were invited to go there, and we had a young man come and play several of his pieces at that time, and it was really quite something. And it was one of the most interesting things that I've ever done, I think. Uh, so that's, uh, that's Edvard. He has, uh, he's considered the darling of Norway. Uh, he was born in Bergen, he died in Bergen. Uh, but a very interesting uh, composer, and uh, I like a lot of his stuff. Uh, I want to move on now to the uh, painting I think some of you have seen one way or another, either in emails or whatever. This is a painting that means a lot to me also. Uh, this is a painting that's supposed to show my feeling about the church, and that this is a church for everybody. And by everybody, I mean young and old alike. <clears throat> the inspiration came from the back of this church. I sat by those windows in the back for five years as a deacon. And you know what I looked at? I looked at the back of things. I saw the back of all of you, all your hairdos and everything. You couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Uh, it. It finally dawned on me that, boy, that, that's interesting. Looking at those feet, the shoes and everything, and I thought that I could put together, maybe a, do a, a, a painting that would kind of give the impression, or give, give the feeling that I have about, about what this church means to me, and it means a lot to you too, I know. Um, so I have over here on the left, these are older legs, okay? We know well about that. You know about that? Yeah. I'm not going to say any more than that. Okay. Over here we have someone who is obviously middle-aged with a high heel, right? And down below I indicated children by putting in a rag doll. So it's, you know, high, medium, and low, that kind of thing. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because from the back, this does not exist in the back. The back pew back there does not have a book rack on it. All right, it's just plain. So I have to add the book rack. So there was a lot of jinking around to get all of this to fit together. And right now, Mark has this in his office, and, uh, and I think he enjoys it. So any questions about it? No? It's so realistic. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting here and looking at the back of the pew, and you certainly captured it. Well, my art is narrative art. Is it oil or acrylic? This is acrylic. And I, I paint on, on a board. I don't paint on canvas. Wow. Okay. Easy. So I paint on what's called gator board. That's like alligator. Oh. You know? Um, it's a special board that is an archival material used by museums to mount photographs permanently, among other things. And it can be used as an art medium to paint on. Uh, you get very good adhesion to it, and its longevity is just outstanding. So, uh, all of these, except for that one I showed you that has the uh, that was done on canvas. That's the only one that was not a big gator board. I find that very interesting. In that the heel is out of the shoe. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. And where's her other leg? I get that one too. Yeah. 
Well, okay. She's crossed her legs. Right. Okay. Yeah. Make of it what you want. When I do a picture, I, I want you to come up with the, with, with the reason that, that you are, are involved with it. Because I try to make people think when they look at art. That, that's a key element in the whole thing. Key element. This painting here, I don't know if you all can see this one or not. I'll, it's not too heavy, so I'll pick it up. <clears throat> this is called Then and Now. Okay? Then and Now. Now, you may not recognize those two people up there in the top, but that's me and my honey bun over here in 1957, a picture taken in 57. Okay, that's then. As you can see, we're looking at each other. <laughs> right? And we're drinking a Coca-Cola and having a hamburger. Uh -uh. All right, now look what happens today. Okay. I think they're actually texting each other. I, I think it's that bad. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? So they sit there and do that. And that actually happened. I saw that in an airport, and that's why I did this painting. I mean, you can't... What are these kids doing this day and time? I, I don't know. But even the older people. I was just in a doctor's office this morning. Mm -hmm. There were seven people waiting. All of them on the phone. It's true everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We live in especially the kids. I, I think we've got a serious problem in this country with, with kids and, and phones. It, it, it becomes the only thing they think of, you know? Right. We would talk to one another. You know, what, how else are we going to do it? I mean, so, but that all changed and has changed. So, anyway. Pardon? Why do you stay with using oils? Why do you switch to acrylics? Acrylics uh, suit my style because I like paint that dries fast. <laughs> Oil takes forever. Yeah, and uh, and I. Right. Well, there you go. So <laughs> they have both in the stores, but uh, I think the majority of painting now is done on on a, with acrylics or with urethanes. Uh, I use some urethanes. Uh, I buy paints everywhere, uh, and uh, and then I coat the paint, coat my painting at the end with a layer of clear urethane to give it permanence. It's almost bulletproof at that point. So there you go. <coughs> Uh, this last one here is one of my favorites. And it comes with a nice story, too. Okay. In Alaska, we have the Alaska Maritime Highway. The Alaska Maritime Highway is a system of routes that connect all of the outside cities, the ones that are touching the water, with service with a ferry boat. Okay, they have like 30 cities, and the ferry boats go back and forth all over Alaska. Alaska is a big place. It's huge. I like to tell my Texas friends a little story. Anybody from Texas here? In Texas? Yeah. See, in Texas, they, they, they think they've got a, a big deal down there, don't they? You know? Big deal in Texas. If you take Alaska and cut it in two geographically and have North Alaska and South Alaska or East Alaska and West Alaska, Texas is number three. They don't like that. Yeah. In addition, Alaska has about 700,000 people. That's one person per square mile. See, everybody has a square mile. 
Well, our home in Alaska was in a city called Homer. Homer is at the end of the Kajimak, near the end of the Kajimak Bay on the Kenai Peninsula. It's about 150 miles from Anchorage. And from that point, it's a good point to jump off and go visit the Aleutian Islands on a supply ferry. And that's what we did one summer. And a supply ferry is a boat that has on the first deck, they have supplies. Generally, there's a truck full of something or something like that that has to move off of the boat when they get to where they're going. And so it carries supplies because some of these places that it visits has no other way of getting materials. There are no roads. You cannot drive to Nome, Alaska. You cannot drive to Juneau, Alaska. There is no road. And so these places exist via the Marion Highway. Um, so Joni and I took, a, took a, 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 a long trip out to the Aleutian Islands, out to the end and back, stopping at the various little towns along the way. One of the towns we stopped at was called Falls Pass. Okay. Falls Pass was named because the water out front looks like you could take your boat and go right through it and go from the Pacific Ocean into the Bering Sea. But you can't do that because it's very shallow. Hence, that was a false idea called the Falls Pass. Falls Pass has about, oh, maybe 35 people living there. <clears throat> Very small. And we landed our boat there, and we're offloading supplies. And Joni and I got off the boat and decided we'd kind of walk around. And we bumped into a lady that was selling salmon soup by the side of the road. Now, these people are, are really hardy people. They like living where they lived. But they are Americans, <laughs> just like us. Uh, anyway, this girl had a daughter, and that's her. Okay, this daughter has a club foot down here. Okay, a beautiful, beautiful child. Really beautiful. The way this child got around was hanging onto her dog, and she'd tell the dog where to go. Okay, why is that happening? because there was no medical attention on this island. Very hard to do anything about it. Up here is her home. Her home. Yeah, that's where she lives. So that's about what this painting is about, about somebody that's really rustic and <clears throat> really tough. And I just think it, uh, it tells the story of, of Alaska. Um, on our trip, we would stop in small towns, and we would find a situation at dinner time where the galley on our boat would not open until like seven o'clock instead of five o'clock. But they opened at seven o'clock, at five o'clock rather, for the people of the island to come and have dinner. They have no restaurants, none. And so they bring their kids on, and they teach them how, how are you going to tell the lady what you want. And she's going to write it down. And she's going to take it, and they're going to make it, and then bring it back to us. And you got to see that to believe it happens. So anyway, I think uh, Alaska made a big impression on us. And uh, I would invite anybody. I think all Americans should be required to go to Alaska for two weeks. And don't do it on a cruise ship, please. That's not Alaska. That's bringing everything we have here right along with us, you know. I want my martini and my steak. Well, you're not gonna get that if you, if you get out and into the wild and talk to me. People are very resilient. They're extremely uh, cognizant of taking care of one another, and they're absolutely super people. Um, anyway, uh, getting back to the very beginning, My first expression was that I had gone down and taken lessons when I was 10 years old. And that was done with, with teachers that, that really cared. Uh, right now, it's a, a 
a situation in art where art is, is slowly dying off, basically. Other things have taken over, budgets have cut art. Uh, however, uh, we do have a person with us who has had a lot of experience with that. And that is Margot Costeca. And she is sitting right here. Margot, is that me? Oh, excuse me, there we go. Margot spent 31 years teaching what this gal did to me in the schools of Ohio. Yep. And, and it's just so, so, so great to have people that are, that are doing that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a labor of love, and uh, I think it pays off. Uh, so uh, I've kind of come to the end of, of what I have prepared for you. I can take any questions you have. What are you working on? I knew you'd ask me that. Thank you very much. Bring a checkbook, we'll talk about it. So, this painting was finished Friday, this last Friday. Are you ready for this? It's not oil. It's not oil. No, it's not oil. Anyway. Is it something that will do its good Friday? Hmm? Is it something that will do its good Friday? No. No, it has to do with birds, among other things. And kids. I like to paint kids. This one is called Good Catch. That's a pelican with a fish in his mouth. Mm hmm. No, I, I don't know what, uh, what that, there's no connection to anybody that I know of. So he's fishing down here and he hadn't caught anything. And meanwhile, this bird comes by and he says, thumbs up, good job, buddy. Yeah, so so we're trying to tell a story I like here. It. I like it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you ever paint pictures of children for people? Yeah. That's another good question. Do I do commission work? Absolutely not. <laughs> Boy, you're absolutely stepping into a real hole if you do that. Uh, the reason is this. Uh, yeah, it kind of fades. Down here it's more red than up here. Yeah, so that's the background. Uh, Actually, I, I took a picture of this, believe it or not. I have a lot of pictures that I've taken. And it was just an accidental picture that showed up. But anyway, and I did two of these. So if you want one, let's talk. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Dave. We mentioned that the women of the fellowship group like to have fun together, and I think we had a fun afternoon, and we certainly appreciate your talents, well, your thank gifts. You. Um, Dave used this verse in the uh, booklet, 2 Timothy 1.6, for this reason I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God. Well, I had to read the chapter to know exactly what he was talking about there, and it's Paul working with Timothy and teaching him strength through the Lord. And when you use the gifts God has given you, God will give you the power. And that's what he was training him, the power. The power to accomplish whatever task he gives you. And I think you have used that power God has given you. Well, and we also had fun learning about his life, didn't we? His, his travels. Let's give Dave a hand. And for the women, we will see you November 13th. Have a very nice six-month little break. And may the Lord bless and keep you. And may we 
be blessed as we're absent one from the other. Thank you.